I still remember that summer camp trip vividly. It happened when I was in eighth grade, in the beautiful lakeside city of Burlington, Ontario, not too far from Toronto. Our school had organized this trip, kind of like a summer camp experience, and we were all eager to embark on this adventure. It was a Catholic school, and as part of our final year, all the eighth graders got to go on two trips. The first one usually took place in the fall, a religious camping trip aimed at promoting Christian values and teamwork. To be honest, none of us were particularly excited about it, as it felt like a never-ending religion class stretched over three days. The second trip, scheduled for spring, was supposed to be a weekend in Ottawa, exploring the city and visiting museums. However, our year took an unexpected turn when it was decided that we would go camping instead, four hours away at Algonquin Provincial Park. The camp was located near one of the park's lakes, set up like a typical summer camp with cabins scattered near the lake and partially in the forest. There were separate buildings for bathrooms and a mess hall. For those not familiar with provincial parks, they're similar to state or national parks in the United States. As expected, the boys and girls stayed in separate cabins. The girls' cabins were perched on supports above the ground and closer to the lake, while our cabins were nestled deeper in the forest, along a gravel road. I shared a relatively large cabin with about four other guys. Our cabin, despite being the largest, was far from comforting. Unlike the other cabins with proper windows and doors that could fully close and lock, ours looked like it was hastily constructed from plywood. It had thin bug screens for windows and a door that wouldn't close properly. Now, I should mention that I had zero experience with actual camping. My family disliked it, so this was a less than ideal first impression of the great outdoors. The creepiness began on the first evening. We were all gathered outside the mess hall for a supposed fun night activity. The camp counselors spun a tale about a hermit who lived nearby in the woods, and we were going on a nighttime expedition to see where he resided. It was a random, intriguing idea, and it caught us by surprise. With our flashlights as our only source of light, we ventured deeper into the dark woods, searching for this hermit's house. Excited screams echoed through the night as we hunted for the mysterious abode. Eventually, we stumbled upon the hermit's dwelling, which was nothing more than a massive log with a makeshift bed. After the eerie encounter, we were escorted back to camp. My group didn't see anything unusual, but other kids started whispering about glimpses of someone lurking in the dark woods. A person from my cabin even claimed to have seen blue glowing eyes in the darkness. I dismissed it as a campfire ghost story meant to spook us, convinced that the person in the woods was just another counselor. But that night, everything changed. Sometime in the middle of the night, I was jolted awake by the sound of someone sprinting down the gravel road that ran to our cabin. At first, I thought it might be an animal, but then I heard the faint crunch of gravel around our cabin. It was too soft for an animal. It was the sound of a person moving. Panic set in as I realized that our cabin door didn't lock, and the thin bug screens offered no protection. If someone wanted to, they could easily push the door open and see inside. My bed was right beside the door, and I kept my eyes locked on it, preparing to scream if someone entered. But the door never opened. The sound outside slowly faded away into the woods, leaving me terrified and baffled. My immediate thought was that it must have been the hermit. I ruled out the possibility of it being a counselor or teacher, as it was well past three o'clock in the morning, an odd time for a check-in. Surprisingly, I managed to fall asleep again after that ordeal. Unfortunately, that was the only interesting part of the camp trip. The remaining days were marred by relentless rain, and some students from our class caught the flu from another school sharing the camp with us. The bus ride back home was partially quarantined. As time passed, I almost forgot about the creepy encounter, attributing it to the possibility of a counselor checking on us. However, the story didn't end there. The following year, it was my younger sister's turn to go on the same 8th grade camping trip. Just like for my class, they went on the strange hermit expedition during the first night. While she initially thought nothing of it, during one of the other days, she and a few friends ventured into the woods by the lake. She described seeing a small hermit-like person sitting on a log in the distance. 
It might not be the creepiest summer camp story ever, but it sends shivers down my spine, knowing that the hermit was indeed real. That seemingly fun camp led a bunch of children to a random guy's house in the middle of the woods, making the entire experience much less enjoyable in retrospect. I've been working in the film industry for a decade now, and while my role isn't exactly glamorous, it's incredible to be a part of this world. In a nutshell, I scout locations for films and ensure they're suitable for specific scenes. Many of my colleagues fell in love with movies at an early age, and the same holds true for me. My grandfather, a producer in the 1960s, worked alongside legendary talents like Audrey Hepburn, Alfred Hitchcock, John Wayne, and even Elvis Presley. As a young child, my grandfather regaled my brother, cousins, and me with captivating stories about the mythical world of Hollywood during that era. Yet as I grew older, I couldn't help but notice my grandmother's discomfort whenever he spoke about his time in the industry. Her uneasy demeanor didn't escape my brother's and my notice, and we began to speculate about the cause. Unfortunately, we eventually arrived at the unsettling possibility that my grandfather might have had an affair during those wild Hollywood years. It seemed like the logical explanation for my grandmother's strange behavior, although we acknowledged it wasn't fair to jump to conclusions. Hollywood during that period was notorious for its extravagant parties and beautiful actresses, and my grandfather, being a prominent producer, fit the profile all too well. So why am I sharing this story now? Last month, my brother and I decided to finally confront my grandmother about what really happened during her time in Hollywood. We no longer wanted to hear the romanticized tales my grandfather had spun for us. Given my own career in the industry, we needed to know the truth, especially if it had been an affair. We approached the subject with utmost delicacy, not wanting to upset her or dredge up painful memories. Until the day he passed away, my grandmother had always expressed profound love and admiration for my grandfather, which made it seem even more peculiar that he might have strayed. My brother, the smooth talker of the two of us, finally asked, Grandma, why did Grandpa leave Hollywood, and why do you always go quiet and leave the room whenever he told us those stories? My grandmother took a deep breath, seemingly preparing herself to share a long-held secret. She began to narrate her story, weaving a tale only an elder could recount in such detail. We couldn't have been more wrong in our assumptions. My grandmother couldn't recall the exact year, but during her husband's tenure as a producer, he decided to move her to Hollywood. At the time, in her early 20s, she harbored dreams of becoming an actress, and she was undeniably beautiful. My grandfather used his connections to secure auditions for her and introduce her to some influential figures in the industry. However, my grandmother was determined not to have her success handed to her merely because she was married to a producer. She used a different last name during auditions and never mentioned her connection to my grandfather, wanting to be judged solely on her talent. After several failed auditions, my grandmother nearly gave up on her dream of acting and considered trying her hand at modeling as she had received some offers. But she had one last audition for what seemed like a significant film opportunity. She recounted how my grandfather was skeptical about this audition, having never heard of the director or the film. However, my grandmother was stubborn and urged him to trust her instincts. On her way to the audition, she got lost and stumbled upon a dilapidated building on the outskirts of town. Being new to the area, she didn't question the location and assumed it was a creative choice made by the director, perhaps even his office. She walked through the door, only to find four individuals inside, three women and one man, all masked. In an instant, my grandmother realized her peril and tried to flee, but two of the women caught her and subjected her to a brutal beating. After a few agonizing minutes, they tied her to a chair, leaving her helpless. One of the women then delivered a chilling ultimatum. My grandmother had to assist them in a robbery if she wished to survive. The consequences of refusing were too grim to imagine. My grandmother reluctantly agreed, hoping that she could find a way to escape this terrifying situation. The woman outlined their plan. She would rob an apartment for them, 
The four assailants assured her that there would be cash on a table inside, and my grandmother had no choice but to comply. She assumed that once inside the apartment, she could locate a phone, or better yet, find the occupant and explain her predicament. They reached the apartment building, and my grandmother's plan began to unravel. The man from the group accompanied her inside, holding a menacing pipe in his hand, which filled her with dread. She suspected that the pipe was intended for her. The apartment's door was unlocked, and they entered. My grandmother was handed a cloth sack and instructed to fill it with cash, assuring her that money would be found on a nearby table. As she cautiously collected the cash, her mind raced, searching for an escape plan. Suddenly, she spotted a glass vase on the table, filled with fresh flowers. With quick thinking and desperation surging through her veins, she seized the vase and shattered it against the man's face. He fell to the ground in pain, allowing her the opportunity to bolt from the apartment. My grandmother stumbled upon a back exit and sprinted several blocks, her heart pounding with fear. She finally encountered a police car parked nearby and approached it frantically. Breathlessly, she explained everything to the officers, desperately pleading for help. Back in those days, the police didn't always respond with urgency when it came to women's distress, and it took them a moment to believe her and take her statement seriously. Eventually, they contacted my grandfather, who decided to raise hell to ensure justice prevailed. Thankfully, my grandmother provided a detailed description of her captors, leading to the arrest of one of the women. However, the other three perpetrators remained at large. My grandmother never discovered the identity of the apartment's owner, but suspected involvement in the sinister underbelly of Hollywood during that era. The woman they arrested admitted to framing my grandmother, intending to incapacitate her inside the apartment after she'd filled the bag with cash. They believed she was merely a young actress, and her capture at the scene would have been another tragic story lost in the dark world of show business. This harrowing nightmare had left my grandmother deeply scarred, compelling her to leave Hollywood and return to her parents' house. My grandfather followed several months later, and that's when they started their family. He told us uplifting and joyful stories to entertain us children, but whenever he mentioned his time in Hollywood, my grandmother couldn't help but recall the traumatic ordeal she endured. I can only imagine the horrors my grandmother experienced during that terrifying ordeal. I am grateful she managed to escape and find some semblance of justice. As for the three other monsters from that night, I can only hope that karma eventually caught up with them, and justice was served in one form or another. My name is Brian and it's two in the morning as I write this. I hope that sharing my experience will help take my mind off the chilling events that unfolded. At the time, I was living in Alaska, approximately 16 miles southwest of Fairbanks. My home was nestled deep within a forest, and my love for the wilderness had led me to this secluded paradise. I was an avid camper, often venturing out into the woods with my two-year-old German shepherd, Cosmo. That particular night, I was feeling the weight of a tough week, so I decided to go camping to ease my mind. My favorite spot lay next to a serene lake, roughly seven miles from my house. Instead of taking the car, I opted for a jog. I grabbed my camping gear, Cosmo's harness and leash, and set off. Given my background as a wildland firefighter, carrying the necessary equipment was second nature to me. It took around two hours to reach our destination, Upon arrival, I wasted no time setting up camp. Then, Cosmo and I ventured upstream to try our luck with fishing. I managed to hook a beautiful rainbow trout. When I returned to camp, however, something unsettling occurred. My tent had inexplicably collapsed. Anyone who has set up a tent knows that they don't just fall on their own. You have to intentionally disassemble them. Perplexed, I erected the tent once more and lit a campfire. I cooked the rainbow trout, and it was nothing short of delicious. Following that, I roasted marshmallows over the fire, not bothering with s'mores, as I preferred them plain. With the fire extinguished, I crawled into the tent with Cosmo, finding solace in the symphony of nature, which had always lulled me to sleep. Sometime in the dead of night, I awoke to the low growl emanating from Cosmo. Irritated at first, 
I was soon gripped by the eerie realization that the forest had fallen silent, save for Cosmo's warning growls. In the darkness, I reached for my backpack and retrieved my 9mm handgun. It was a well-ingrained instinct. If the forest went silent, something was out there. I sat there, clutching my gun, for what felt like an eternity, but was likely only minutes. Then it came, a sound that sent shivers down my spine. It was reminiscent of a caribou's call, but distorted, almost gargling. My heart raced as I heard a twig snap nearby, so close it felt as if it was just outside the tent. Without hesitation, I fired a warning shot into the air. The sudden blast seemed to startle whatever lurked in the darkness, and it retreated. But the forest remained eerily silent, and my unease grew. At six foot three, and with a desire to appear fearless, I bellowed a menacing warning into the night, threatening to shoot if whatever it was returned. To my disbelief, it did come back. This time, it brushed against the side of the tent, taunting me with its malevolent presence. In a surge of terror, I fired at it, and it darted away into the depths of the forest. Suddenly, all the ambient sounds of the wilderness rushed back, filling the void that had existed during the creature's sinister visit. I stayed vigilant, my gun at the ready, but with the break of dawn, I made my decision. I swiftly packed up my camp, secured Cosmo's harness, and fled the scene, sprinting two miles and jogging the rest of the way. I cannot say for certain what I had encountered that night, but I was grateful that it had played out the way it did, sparing me from whatever malevolent force lurked in the darkness. Last month, I embarked on a journey to visit my grandparents after a couple of years of absence. I know it might sound terrible, but the truth is, my grandparents live on the other side of the country, making it challenging to visit frequently. This visit was more than just a casual family gathering. It was a grand family reunion, an opportunity to reconnect with cousins, aunts, and uncles I hadn't seen in what felt like an eternity. My grandparents' residence was a sprawling farm, a place I remembered fondly from my childhood. When we lived just 30 minutes away, we used to visit occasionally and stay overnight. Every one of those nights had been filled with incredible memories, and I always felt safe within the walls of that farmhouse. Little did I know that beneath the facade of tranquility lay a horrifying tale. As the family sat around, swapping stories and laughter, my grandfather decided to share something that would send shivers down my spine. It was a night when my cousin James and I had stayed overnight at the farm, a night that would forever haunt my dreams. The recollection of that evening came rushing back as my grandpa began his unsettling narrative. I remember precisely which night it was, because it was the only time in my life when my grandpa had raised his voice at me. The night started innocently, as most sleepovers do. James and I played outside, devoured pot pies with extra gravy, and sipped on root beers, pretending they were real beers. The farmhouse had a creepy little loft with a pull-out bed and a small TV, where we had our PlayStation hooked up. We'd typically stay up all night, engrossed in games like Spyro the Dragon and Crash Bandicoot. However, that night, as the clock neared midnight, our world was shaken by an ear-splitting bang from downstairs. We instinctively paused the game, locking eyes with a sickening feeling in our stomachs. My initial thought was that one of my grandparents had taken a tumble, and I didn't know if I had the mental strength at that time to help them up. We sat in silence for what felt like an eternity, straining our ears for any sound from below. The silence was deafening, leaving us in an agonizing state of uncertainty. Tentatively, we resumed our game, trying to dismiss the eerie atmosphere that had settled upon us. But something felt off. An inexplicable unease had taken hold of us. James halted the game again, suggesting that one of us should check on our grandparents, just in case they needed our help. I reluctantly agreed and opened the loft door, which was attached to the ceiling. As it creaked open, a small, ladder-like staircase descended. I descended the stairs as quietly as I could, straining to hear any clues from the lower floor. Faint murmurs reached my ears, but the words remained indistinct. With cautious steps, I moved down the hallway, 
my heart pounding in my chest. Then, another loud bang, this time akin to a door slamming, sent me nearly jumping out of my skin. Fear surged through me as I continued to advance. And then, I saw my grandpa turning the corner, his eyes filled with an intensity I had never witnessed before. Without uttering a word, he pointed towards the loft and shouted at the top of his lungs. It was a bone-chilling scream, unlike anything I'd heard from him before. I was terrified, and it was made even worse by the look of sheer urgency on his face. In sheer panic, I spun around, sprinting back up to the loft and hastily shutting off the TV. James bombarded me with questions, but I could only manage to hiss at him to keep quiet, and that Grandpa was angry with us. Throughout the night we heard more loud banging and shuffling, but exhaustion eventually overtook us, and we fell asleep. The following morning, we found our grandparents looking exhausted in the living room. My grandpa had his hunting rifle out, an unusual sight that we didn't question at the time. Despite their strange demeanor that morning, we let it go and continued with our visit. It wasn't until the family reunion that my grandpa finally disclosed the truth about that fateful night. The initial bang that had sent shivers down our spines was the sound of an intruder attempting to break down the front door. My grandpa, in a fit of bravery, had managed to scare the intruder away temporarily. But when I had descended the loft stairs and heard the second loud noise, it was the sound of the intruder successfully breaking into the house. My grandma had managed to hide in a coat closet, while my grandpa, on turning the corner and spotting me in the hallway, had only yelled the word now in a desperate attempt to communicate that I needed to return to the loft. He didn't want the intruder to realize there was another person in the house. My grandpa had grabbed his hunting rifle to ensure our safety, and although he had called the sheriff, he convinced him that no immediate action was required. He provided an unofficial report over the phone, explaining the situation. All of this unfolded while James and I were blissfully unaware upstairs and we never realized how close we had come to a potentially life-threatening situation. As my grandpa recounted the tale, I felt a mix of anger and understanding. They had kept us ignorant to protect us, and it had worked. My grandpa emerged as a legendary defender of his home, wife, and grandchildren, but it was clear that the trauma of that night had left a lasting mark on him. It makes you wonder what other dangers lurk when you believe you're safe. I live in Montana on a small 20-acre ranch with my parents and my three sisters. My twin's name is Sky, and my second oldest sister, who is also a part of this story, is named Jess. We all loved going on night trail rides, especially just at dusk. We had done this many times, so we knew these trails very well. On the evening in question, we gathered our horses and prepared for the ride. We made sure to bring a flashlight with us and wore those reflecting bright yellow coat things for safety. Once we were all set, we mounted up and set off. By this time, the sun was setting, and the moon was just over half full, providing enough light for us to see clearly. We decided to take a roundabout trail from the barn, which led us through a dense forest, and eventually back to the barn. Sky rode in front, I was in the middle, and Jess brought up the rear. As we ventured deeper into the woods, we heard the unmistakable sound of a stick breaking, Initially, we didn't think too much of it, assuming it might be a deer or some other harmless creature. However, as we continued, we heard another breaking stick, this time much closer. We grew cautious and began to notice something odd, the absolute silence that surrounded us. No chirping crickets, rustling leaves, or distant calls of animals. It was eerily quiet. Our horses began to grow uneasy and skittish. They refused to stand still, constantly stepping to the side and nervously scanning the surroundings with their ears perked up. Then, out of nowhere, a shrill, demonic-sounding scream pierced the air, originating just to our left. Our horses went berserk, bolting away in sheer panic. We clung to our saddles, too terrified to even think straight. As we raced through the forest, the sound of heavy pounding steps echoed behind us steadily closing in. Despite our horses reaching speeds of about 25 miles per hour, the ominous footsteps grew nearer. 
I couldn't resist the urge to glance over my shoulder. In the moonlight, I caught a glimpse of a long, skinny, bony creature with ghastly white eyes. It was indescribably horrifying to look at, and its mere presence filled me with an overwhelming sense of dread. We continued our frantic ride until we were just a few feet from the safety of the barn. Miraculously, our horses suddenly came to a screeching halt. However, the pursuing footsteps ceased just as abruptly. We dismounted and hurriedly entered the barn, locking the door behind us. Our hearts pounded in our chests, and fear gripped us like a vice. Inside the barn we huddled together, trembling with terror. Our parents were out of town, and our older sister was in her room, oblivious to the horrors unfolding outside. None of us had our phones with us, leaving us isolated and utterly defenseless. Throughout the long, harrowing night, we remained vigilant, convinced that the creature would return to haunt us. The thought of venturing outside seemed impossible. We were paralyzed by the fear of what awaited us in the darkness. We anxiously awaited the first light of morning, clinging to the hope that daylight would bring safety. As the sun's rays finally broke over the horizon, we wasted no time. With adrenaline-fueled determination, we left the barn, running toward the house. Once inside, we quickly gathered our older sister and recounted the terrifying events of the night. We also called our parents, desperate for their reassurance and guidance. Unfortunately, our parents didn't believe our chilling tale. We were left feeling helpless and vulnerable, fearing that the unknown creature might return to harm our horses and other livestock. If anyone out there has any knowledge of what this nightmarish entity might be, please share your insights in the comments below. We are desperate to learn more and gain an understanding of the horrifying encounter that still haunts our dreams. I had never realized just how many fascinating stories my grandpa had. Our relationship had always been distant, not due to any animosity, but simply because our lives rarely crossed paths. However, a few years ago, my grandmother passed away and I witnessed the profound loneliness and sadness that gripped my grandfather's heart. It was then that I decided to make an effort to spend more time with him, whether out of guilt for not being there for my grandmother, or out of genuine concern for his well-being. I began visiting his house once a week for a simple coffee and a chat. I knew my grandpa had served in the military, but he had never shared any wartime stories with me while I was growing up. I believed he had served in the Korean War, but the specifics were a mystery to me. All I knew for certain was that he had been stationed in Germany and a few other European countries during his service. One afternoon as we sipped our coffee, the topic of his military service came up organically in our conversation. He revealed to me that he hadn't met my grandma until he returned home from the war. In Europe, he had been a single man, and he recounted how he spent a significant amount of time with women during that period. During his time in Germany, he and some fellow soldiers had ventured into a local establishment, though he was unsure whether it was a bar or a pub by the cultural terminology. There, he had a fateful encounter with a woman named Irma. As he began describing Irma, it became evident that he was deeply smitten by her. He painted a vivid picture of her beauty, with her curly blonde hair, bright blue eyes, and a smile that could seemingly illuminate an entire room. His words, not mine. Despite the language barrier, he knew a little German, and she knew a little English. They instantly connected. As he recounted their meeting, I was surprised by the daring nature of their encounter, given the norms of the 1950s. He continued by describing their walk to Irma's place. Initially, they traversed dimly lit and somewhat secluded alleyways, surrounded by the rustling of twigs and leaves. At the time, my grandpa attributed the sounds to possibly being just forest animals. Eventually, they arrived at a small cottage, nestled about a hundred yards into the woods. Irma had invited him inside. The cottage, as he described it, sounded like something out of an old fairy tale. It was constructed entirely of wood, with a comforting fireplace, two small chairs facing it, a loft accessible via a ladder that held a small bed, a table, and a petite kitchen area. Irma lit a fire and poured my grandpa some beer. Emboldened by romance, 
he asked her to come back to America with him once his military service concluded, a proposition that I found hard to fathom. Irma seemed flattered but evaded his question multiple times. As he continued narrating, a shift in his tone and demeanor signaled that the story was about to take a sinister turn. Irma began unbuttoning his military uniform, and he momentarily turned his head, losing himself in the passion of the moment. What he saw outside the window, however, jolted him out of his reverie. He leaped from his chair, urgently trying to explain to Irma what he had glimpsed. According to him, a man had appeared in the window, spying on them. As soon as the intruder realized he had been spotted, he ducked out of sight. While my grandpa was concerned, Irma appeared dismissive and attempted to distract him. However, my grandpa, torn between his desire for Irma and his instinct to protect her, grew increasingly uneasy. He began recalling the unsettling noises he had heard during their journey to the cottage and feared they might have been followed from the pub. Eventually, he mustered the courage to break away from Irma and insisted on inspecting the situation outside. Irma, though visibly upset, remained silent. Rushing to the table near the door, where he had placed his weapon, my grandpa discovered that it had vanished. He turned back to Irma, seeking answers, but she stood motionless in front of the fireplace. At that very moment, a burly man speaking German barged through the door. He struck my grandpa in the face with such force that the pain was likened to an iron fist colliding with his skull. My grandpa, disoriented and in agony, was unable to move as the man proceeded to assault him mercilessly. He described it as the most excruciating pain he had ever endured, to the point where he felt almost numb. The attacker hurled my grandpa onto the table inside the cottage, produced a hunting knife, and brutally stabbed him in the side. Irma, now panicking, joined in the chaos. The room echoed with their frantic exchange in German, a language my grandpa had only limited knowledge of, further adding to his confusion, compounded by the throbbing pain from the sucker punch. Helplessly pinned to the table, my grandpa lay there, applying pressure to the wound in a desperate bid to stave off the bleeding, yearning to see the sun again. In the end, he succumbed to unconsciousness, and it was only through the serendipitous discovery of one of his military buddies that he survived that night. This comrade had been leaving the pub that evening, catching a glimpse of Irma and the unfamiliar assailant running down the road. A nagging suspicion gnawed at him, compelling him to follow Irma's path. Along the way, he encountered muddy footprints originating from the forest. These footprints led him to the open cottage door, revealing my grandfather unconscious on the table. With extraordinary strength, he carried my grandfather all the way back to their military base. Thankfully, the medical personnel managed to save him, and my grandpa thanked his lucky stars every day for his friend's timely intervention. They remained in touch until my grandpa's passing five years ago, with the friend constantly reminding him that he was a hero and that he owed him his life. I too wished I could thank that unsung hero for his selflessness. As my grandpa showed me the scar from that dreadful night, he confessed that even after all those years, he could still feel the phantom pain. Every time he beheld that scar, he was haunted by the memory of the horrific ordeal. Strangely, his deepest sorrow lay not in the brutal attack he endured, but in the fact that he never saw Irma again. Neither she nor the enigmatic man who had accompanied her were ever apprehended by the authorities. Listening to my grandpa recount this harrowing tale, I was both fascinated and terrified. It was a story of love, betrayal, and survival, a tale that emphasized the importance of caution in matters of the heart. As my grandpa concluded his narrative, he offered me this chilling warning. Be careful who you give your heart to, because they may just try to cut it out when you least expect it. As the lush greenery of northeast Louisiana faded into the rearview mirror, I couldn't help but feel a mix of excitement and apprehension. I'm Robert, just an ordinary 18-year-old guy, but this trip to Washington State felt like stepping into a whole new world. My friends Drew, Gregory, and Jolene were with me, all of us eager to escape the mundane routines of our small-town life. 
The car hummed along the interstate, the miles slipping away under us, like water under a bridge. Drew, always the joker, kept us entertained with his endless stories and off-tune singing. Gregory, the oldest at nineteen, played the role of the responsible one, though his eyes shone with the same excitement that filled the car. Jolene, with her quiet smile and thoughtful gaze, seemed to absorb every detail of our journey. As we crossed state lines, the landscape began to change. The flat expanses of the south gave way to towering mountains and dense forests of the Pacific Northwest. It was like entering a C.J. Box novel, where the scenery is as much a character as the people. I imagined a world of hidden mysteries and untold stories lurking in those woods, and a shiver ran down my spine. We arrived at my uncle's house in Washington after what felt like an eternity. His small, cozy home was nestled in the heart of the woods, a stark contrast to the wide-open spaces of Louisiana. My uncle, a rugged man with a warm smile, welcomed us like we were his own kids. His small family, including a couple of hyperactive kids and a dog that wouldn't stop barking, added to the lively atmosphere. For the next few days, we immersed ourselves in the local culture and landscapes. We hiked through trails that snaked through the forest, the air fresh with the scent of pine and earth. In the evenings, we would gather around the fireplace, sharing stories and laughing until our sides hurt. Then Gregory, always the adventurer, suggested we spend our last night camping in the nearby woods. The idea struck me like a bolt of lightning. Camping in the vast, unknown wilderness of Washington was not something I was prepared for. A million thoughts raced through my head. The isolation, the unpredictability of nature, the sheer thrill of it. Drew and Jolene are in, Gregory said, his eyes alight with the prospect of an adventure. I hesitated, the words caught in my throat, but something in me wanted to break free from the safety of the known, to step into the wild unknown. All right, I finally agreed, my voice barely a whisper. We borrowed two tents from my uncle and set out for the woods. It was hardly remote. The faint glow of the porch light was still visible from our campsite. But as we set up the tents and gathered around the fire we built, the woods around us felt like a different world. The trees stood like silent sentinels, and the night air was filled with the sounds of the wilderness. It was exciting and terrifying all at once. As the fire died down and my friends retreated to their tents, a sense of unease settled over me. The woods seemed to close in, and every snap of a twig or rustle of leaves sent my heart racing. I stayed up with Jolene, trying to shake the feeling off. But then, we saw it. Something massive and silent, moving in the shadows. My heart stopped. This was no ordinary camping trip. We were in CJ Box territory now, and the story was just beginning. The night had draped itself over the forest like a dark, heavy cloak, and the campfire's glow seemed to be the only thing holding back the darkness. As I sat there, the flames casting dancing shadows on Jolene's face, I could feel the forest's eyes on us, watching, waiting. Jolene, with her auburn hair reflecting the firelight, seemed lost in thought. I wondered what mysteries were locked behind those deep green eyes. We talked in hushed tones, our conversation meandering like a lazy river. But as the fire crackled and popped, a prickling sense of unease grew at the back of my neck. Suddenly, Jolene's hand gripped my arm, her fingers cold and tight. She nodded towards the edge of the firelight. There, amidst the darkness, was something massive. It was like a shadow, yet more solid, more real. It moved with a grace that belied its size, silent as the night itself. Panic gripped me, but I couldn't move. My mind raced with every horror story I'd ever heard, every monster from childhood nightmares. We stumbled back to our tent, our breaths coming in short, sharp gasps. We had to wake Gregory. He was the oldest, the de facto leader of our little group. He'd know what to do. Gregory, half asleep and annoyed, barely registered our panicked words. Go back to sleep, y'all, he mumbled, 
dismissing our fears as he curled back into his sleeping bag. But sleep was the last thing on my mind. The forest seemed to close in around us, suffocating, oppressive. Time stretched on, each minute an eternity. Then the creature returned. Its footsteps were soft, but to my heightened senses, they sounded like thunder. Gregory, oblivious to the world, snored softly. I couldn't blame him. Until you see it, the monster is just a story. My hand closed around the hatchet Gregory had carelessly tossed aside. Its weight was reassuring, a tangible anchor in a sea of fear. Jolene's eyes, wide with terror, met mine. We were in this together, whatever this was. The decision to check on Drew was born of necessity. He was out there, alone and vulnerable. Jolene, braver than I would ever be, took the hatchet and stepped out into the night. Her courage astounded me, but she was back in an instant, her face a mask of terror. She gasped. I couldn't leave it at that. Drew was out there. I had to know, had to see it for myself. Stepping out of the tent, I was met with the oppressive silence of the forest. There it was, the creature, its immense form looming over us. Fear and adrenaline surged through me, and I did the only thing I could. I swung the hatchet. The creature let out a sound that was half scream, half roar, a sound that chilled me to the bone. It vanished into the woods, leaving behind only the echo of its cry. The sound woke Drew and Gregory, their faces etched with confusion and fear. What was that? Gregory asked, his voice trembling. But before any of us could answer, Drew pointed to the ground. There, imprinted in the soft earth, were footprints. Huge, unmistakable footprints. His whisper cut through the night. Bigfoot. The words hung in the air, a chilling testament to the reality we had just faced. We were no longer just kids on a camping trip. We were survivors, witnesses to something beyond understanding. And as I lay there, listening to the sounds of the night, I knew one thing for certain. The woods were no longer just trees and shadows. They were alive, and they were watching. The forest was silent in the aftermath, the kind of silence that screams louder than any noise. The creature had vanished into the darkness, leaving behind a void filled with our racing hearts and heavy breaths. As I stood there, hatchet in hand, I could feel the weight of the unknown pressing down on us. Gregory and Drew were now wide awake, their faces pale in the dim light of the dying fire. What was that? Drew's voice was barely a whisper, his eyes wide with a mix of fear and fascination. I shook my head, unable to find the words. The echo of the creature's scream still rang in my ears. It was a sound that didn't belong in this world, a cry that spoke of ancient, hidden things. Jolene clung to my arm, her body trembling. It was huge, she stammered, like nothing I've ever seen. Her eyes, usually so full of life, were clouded with fear. Gregory, ever the skeptic, tried to rationalize. Maybe it was just a bear, he suggested, but his voice lacked conviction. We all knew it was no bear. The footprints we had seen were too large, too strange. The night passed in fitful silence. None of us could sleep, our minds haunted by what we had seen. The forest that had once seemed so inviting now felt like a prison, holding us in its dark embrace. As dawn broke, the light seemed to chase away some of the fear that had enveloped us. My uncle, alerted by the commotion, arrived with a pistol and a lantern, his expression a mix of concern and confusion. What the hell was that? he demanded, scanning the woods as if expecting the creature to reappear. Gregory pointed to the footprints, now even more pronounced in the morning light. We don't know, he admitted, his voice tight. But whatever it was, I'm not staying to find out. The decision to leave was unanimous. We packed up our camp in silence, each lost in our own thoughts. The ride back to my uncle's house was a quiet one, the events of the night hanging over us like a dark cloud. The journey back to Louisiana was a blur. We spoke little, each of us processing the experience in our own way. The once lively conversations were replaced by a heavy quiet, broken only by the hum of the car on the highway. As I lay in my bed that night, back in the familiar surroundings of my home, 
The events in the woods felt like a distant dream, but the fear, the awe, and the wonder of that night were all too real. It was a reminder of the mysteries that lie hidden in the dark corners of the world, a whisper of the unknown that lurks just beyond our understanding. I knew one thing for certain, that night in the woods would stay with me forever, a haunting memory of the time when we came face to face with something truly inexplicable. There's something about the road at night that's always spoken to me. Maybe it's the way the moonlight plays tricks on your eyes, or how the world seems to stand still while you keep moving. My name's Devin, and I've been a trucker for over a decade now. I come from a line of truckers down in Mexico, and if there's one thing my cousins and uncles love more than the road, it's the stories they've picked up along it. Stories of the paranormal, the kind that make you look over your shoulder, I never bought into it much, until that night. The route from southeastern Wisconsin to southern Michigan had become like a second home to me. Every curve of the road, every gas station, every billboard was a familiar face. It was a clear night, the kind where the stars try to outshine each other. I was making good time, humming along to some old tune on the radio, the hum of my truck's engine a comforting constant beneath. The drop yard was quiet when I arrived just the sound of my boots crunching gravel. I did a quick switch, finding the trailer I was supposed to haul back over the legal weight limit. It wasn't the first time, and it wouldn't be the last. Company policy was clear. When in doubt, swap it out. So I found myself hooking up to an empty trailer instead. That's when the night started to stray from the usual script. I was back on the road, cutting through the rural country roads to avoid the tolls. The company always said, the less we spend on tolls, the more we can pay you. I didn't mind. It gave me more time to think, more time with the night. It was around two in the morning when I saw him, a figure walking on the shoulder of the road. He was wearing a hard hat and neon green pants, a reflective vest that caught my headlights from a distance. It was odd, no construction signs or work lights, just him in the dark road. As I drove closer, he turned and waved, a casual, friendly gesture. But something was off. The way he stood, the way the moonlight didn't quite reach him. I passed him, glancing in my rearview mirror. I was about to chalk it up to a night worker or a hitchhiker when I saw it, or didn't see it. He was gone. In that split second, he had vanished. I told myself it was just a trick of the light, the fatigue playing with my mind. I pushed the thought aside, focusing on the road, but the unease settled in the pit of my stomach, a silent companion for the rest of the journey. The road stretched out before me, bordered by dense woods, and the night felt heavier than before. I remembered my family's stories, the tales that I had always dismissed. Was I about to have one of my own? Little did I know, the night had just begun. The road has a way of getting into your head especially in the dead of night. After that brief, unsettling encounter with the man who wasn't there, I could feel the silence pressing in around me. The dashboard clock glowed 2.15 in the morning, a stark reminder of the solitude of the night shift. I tried to shake off the feeling, but it clung to me like the chill of early morning fog. The landscape outside was a monochrome world, painted in shades of darkness and faint moonlight. Each passing mile felt like a step deeper into an unknown territory, even though I'd driven this route more times than I could count. Then came the knocks. Three sharp, deliberate sounds from the back of the trailer. My heart skipped a beat. I've heard a lot of noises on the road, but this was different. It wasn't the usual creaks and groans of cargo shifting or the road's uneven surface. This was something intentional. I slowed down, my eyes flicking to the mirrors, half expecting to see something, but there was only the dark road and the dense woods on either side. The knocking had stopped as suddenly as it had started. Just your imagination, Devon, I muttered to myself, trying to brush off the unease. But as the miles wore on, the silence was shattered again. Five loud knocks, harder and more urgent than before. My grip on the steering wheel tightened. 
This wasn't right. Every instinct I had screamed that something was off. I knew my truck, and I knew that sound wasn't normal. I couldn't ignore it any longer. I had to check. The next safe spot I found, I pulled over, the gravel crunching under my tires. The night seemed to hold its breath as I stepped out, flashlight in hand. My heart was pounding as I made my way to the back of the trailer. I was a rational man, but in that moment, every ghost story I'd ever scoffed at came rushing back to me. The back of the trailer was as I'd left it, locked and secure. I hesitated before unlocking it, half expecting to find something or someone inside. But when I swung the doors open, the beam of my flashlight revealed nothing but empty space. I let out a breath I didn't realize I'd been holding. I was alone. At least, that's what logic told me. But the knocks. I couldn't explain them away. I closed the trailer, locking it back up, and climbed back into the cab. My hands were shaking slightly as I started the engine. I tried to focus on the road, but my thoughts kept drifting back to the empty trailer and the unexplained knocks. Then, without warning, the calm of the night was shattered. A massive tree crashed onto the road just ahead of my truck. I slammed on the brakes, heart in my throat. There was no wind, no sound of splintering wood beforehand. It was as if the tree had decided to fall at that very moment. Fear gripped me, a primal, instinctive fear. I didn't stick around to ponder the why or how. I maneuvered around the fallen giant and didn't stop until I reached the next truck stop. I had to know what was in my trailer, once and for all. The road never felt lonelier than it did that night. After narrowly missing that falling tree, my nerves were shot, hands still trembling slightly on the wheel. I kept replaying the night's events in my head, each detail more unsettling than the last. The ghostly figure on the road, the inexplicable knocks, and now this. As I drove on, the stillness of the night felt oppressive, like a heavy blanket smothering my thoughts. I couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't alone, that whatever had knocked on my trailer was still with me, following silently in the darkness. The knocks returned as I neared my destination, this time more frantic, as if in a hurry. Five quick, hard thuds that made me jump in my seat. I turned down the radio, straining to hear anything else, but there was only the sound of the road and my own ragged breathing. It was then I made the connection. The knocks. They were a warning. Something, maybe someone, was trying to tell me something. Had it been trying to warn me about the tree? The thought sent a shiver down my spine. Maybe my family's stories weren't just stories after all. Maybe I'd been too quick to dismiss the idea of the paranormal. I pulled into the yard, my eyes weary from strain and my mind heavy with questions. I parked the truck and sat there for a moment, gathering my courage. I needed to see, to know for sure what was in that trailer. The yard was silent as I made my way to the back of the trailer. The air felt charged every sound amplified in the stillness. I unlocked the door, half expecting to find something waiting for me. But when I opened it, the trailer was as empty as it had been before. No sign of anything out of the ordinary. I stood there, flashlight in hand, staring into the empty space. What had I heard? What had been knocking? I couldn't find an answer, and that bothered me more than anything. I closed up the trailer, making sure it was secure and did a final walk around. Everything was as it should be, but the feeling of unease lingered. As I drove the last leg of my route, the sun began to rise, casting a soft light over the landscape. The world felt different in the daylight, less threatening. I tried to convince myself that it had all been a trick of my tired mind, but deep down, I knew it wasn't. I finished my run and unhooked the trailer, going through the motions mechanically, my mind was elsewhere, lost in thought. I couldn't shake the feeling that I'd been given a warning, that something out there had looked out for me. As I drove home, the first light of dawn breaking over the horizon, I found myself speaking into the empty cab. Thank you, I said softly, not sure who or what I was thanking. Maybe it was just the road, or maybe it was something more, but whatever it was, I was grateful. The story scared me, sure 
but it also left me with a sense of wonder. Maybe there was more to this world than I'd thought, more mysteries hidden in the dark corners of the night. Maybe, I thought, as I headed home, I just had my first real encounter with the unknown. It was about a year ago when I first heard this chilling story from my grandma, and it still sends shivers down my spine. Sadly, she passed away just a few weeks ago. May her soul rest in peace. I thought I should share this bizarre tale that she confided in me, hoping it would captivate you as it did me and my husband. The revelation that my grandma had been married before my papa left me dumbfounded. I'm 30 years old and I had never known this dark secret. What shocked me even more was that my papa was equally unaware of this hidden chapter in her life. She had kept it hidden all these years, not wanting to hurt him, and as time went on, it seemed less and less significant, especially since she had never had any children with her first husband. She described him as a dangerous man, and the fact that she had married him when she was just 19 years old was mind-boggling. She was drawn to the bad boy persona, attracted to the danger he exuded. His name was Dawn. Dawn had a way of making her feel important, and in the world he inhabited, he was both feared and respected. The fact that he took an interest in her made her fall head over heels. They embarked on a tumultuous journey together, and my grandma became entangled in Dawn's world. Dawn had a distinctive appearance. He would roll his cigarettes in a short-sleeved shirt, his hair always slicked back. He was the type who always got what he wanted, even if it meant resorting to force at times. However, he shielded her from the worst of it, making her wait outside or in another room when things got rough. She admitted to being scared most of the time, but there was something addictive about the fear, something that held her captive. First love always has a vice-like grip on one's heart for better or for worse. Their lives were transient, living in a small boarding house, paying weekly for a room. Their constant movement necessitated such arrangements, as they needed to be able to leave at a moment's notice. One fateful night, Dawn burst into their room, wild and angry, insisting that they needed to leave immediately. My grandma could see what looked like bloodstains on his shirt and jeans. She was upset and tried to get him to calm down and explain, but he was relentless in his anger and yelling. She quickly learned that when Dawn was in this state, it was best to comply with his demands without question. They hit the road, and for hours, he remained silent. It wasn't until my grandma couldn't take the silence any longer that she asked what had happened. Dawn's response was chilling. He told her they would never speak of that night again and instructed her to forget about it. Even though my grandma knew about the terrible things Dawn did, this felt different, somehow worse. It was a line crossed, a boundary shattered, and the memory of that feeling haunted her. Eventually, they moved on and decided to have a small wedding ceremony. My grandma longed for children, but Dawn always told her that someday they would have them. That day never came, and my grandma's patience began to wear thin. Dawn's bad boy persona was finally starting to affect her, as she constantly worried that he would come home covered in blood, or worse, not come home at all. One night her worst fears nearly became a horrifying reality. They were spending an evening together when there was a knock at the door. An older gentleman stood outside, someone my grandma didn't recognize. Dawn's reaction was fierce. He yelled at her to stay in the bedroom. She pressed her ear to the door, trying to catch snippets of the heated conversation. She couldn't make out all the words, but the exchange sounded hostile. Minutes later, Dawn entered the room and informed her that he needed to leave and would return later. She tried to pry information out of him, to understand where he was going and what had happened, but he remained tight-lipped. There was something different about him this time. He didn't seem angry, but rather, he appeared scared. That night, Dawn never returned. My grandma didn't call the police as Dawn had always warned her never to involve law enforcement, no matter what happened. Instead, she decided to take matters into her own hands and become her own detective. 
She scoured their small apartment for any clues, and she stumbled upon some notes with a street address. Determined and anxious, she walked to that address the next morning, hoping to find Dawn. However, she didn't find him there. Instead, she uncovered a scene that would haunt her for decades, a warehouse filled with unspeakable horrors. I won't go into the gruesome details, but it involved a considerable amount of blood and a lifeless body. She rushed to a nearby store and asked the clerks to call the police, claiming that she had stumbled upon the site by accident. She never considered implicating Dawn, as he had always made it clear that she should never betray him. The body was never identified, and as far as she knew, it remained a John Doe. What made matters even more complicated was that one of the officers who had comforted her that fateful afternoon later became my papa. That's why she never wanted to admit to him that she might have known the potential culprits, as it weighed heavily on her conscience. She erased all traces of Dawn from her life, though there wasn't much to erase because he forced them to live a minimalist lifestyle. It wasn't immediate, but eventually, she started developing feelings for my papa, and they began seeing each other. A few weeks after the warehouse incident, she came to terms with the fact that Dawn was never coming back. For a long time, she wondered about his fate. Was he dead? Had he fled the country? Or did he simply want to separate from her? When I asked for Dawn's last name so I could try to find him for her, she just smiled sadly and said that she had given up on wanting to know what happened years ago. She believed she had made the right choice by ending up with my papa. The fear of Dawn finding her one day, of him lurking in the shadows, haunted her for years. With my aunt's birth that fear intensified, and she lived in constant dread, believing that Dawn was watching her, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. Now that she's passed away, I'll never know Dawn's real name or where he ended up, and perhaps that's for the best. It's astounding to me that my grandma had been married to a criminal, even if it was an unofficial marriage. She retrieved an old box from storage and showed me her wedding ring and a picture of Dawn from back then. As I watched her stare at that picture, I could see the mix of fear and love in her eyes. My poor grandma, the fear she must have endured daily for such a long time, it truly must have been a living nightmare. 